Okay, welcome back. This is the last episode in the story of the frogs on the islands in the Gulf of Guinea. We've done a lot of stuff. We started out with the puzzle. The puzzle being A, amphibians on oceanic islands. That was puzzle number one. And then there was an auxiliary puzzle, which was even more bizarre in some sense, which is their most DNA analysis tells us that they're most related to the frogs of East Africa. After that, we ventured some hypotheses. Everything from human transport, we know that's not true because the divergence time is millions of years, so this is not something that happened in the last 10,000 years or something like that. Uh, we ventured a guess having to do with transport by, of eggs and birds. That's, a, that's still viable. There are no migratory birds that actually make this path. That's no proof, but it's just a comment. And the hypothesis that we're working with is this idea that the frogs might have been transported in brackish water by very strong currents at the exit from the Congo River, which goes north along the Gulf of Guinea and then turns off towards the west and could lead to collisions with Sao Tome and Principe. That's, that's the sort of the biological, evolutionary, biogeographical background. We then undertook a bunch of physics things. So we talked about the notion that putting frogs in salt water leads to an osmotic shock Osmotic shock leads to water transport, which is harmful for the organism. And we explored that by asking ourselves the question of, you know, what determines the water flow? It's a driving force due to entropy maximization. And we worked out a little toy example of a, a device that has uh, two reservoirs of water. One side has glucose in it, just as an example. There's a semi-permeable membrane. The water will flow over to that side and it will lift the water. And we worked that out, what the height is that the water would go to. We then talked uh, in some detail about, um, about the linear transport laws. And that's what we're going to exploit now to try to estimate the time scale for the frogs to lose all their water. This is, a, this is an order of magnitude analysis based on, we could do it simply on the basis of dimensional analysis, but instead we're going to do it by trying to write down the laws and to understand what's going on. So here, here's the logic. I want to compute dv by dt. That is the rate at which the volume of the frog changes, and I'm going to write that as g water, j water, sorry, times a. So this quantity is the rate of change of volume of the frog. And this is the water flux. And A is the area of the frog. So that's the thing that we need to work out. So what that tells me is that, you know, I, I, could, I could say that um, the, the volume, uh, let's see, how do I want to write this down? I mean, um, I, could, I could note that delta V is equal to JW times A times T, which tells me that the time for drying out, so time to dry out, is e given, the time scale is given by the volume over JW times A. So that's it. I mean, that's, that's basically the estimate that we need to make. The time to dry out is given by the volume of the thing that's drying out and then divided by the, the flux. You can see that the larger the flux, the faster the drying out will occur. So now we want to appeal to the linear transport laws. And let me just look and see what form I wanted to write this in. Um, okay. I'm going to write this. Uh, well, let's see. I don't like that notation. So um, I can write it in this form. So this is the osmotic pressure difference. And then this thing is a permeability. And I hope you can see, because the left-hand side, JW, has units of centimeters cubed 
per centimeter squared per second. Let's just think about that for a second. This is water flux out of the frog. And the point is, is the water flux is carrying volume with it. So the flux is going to have units of volume carried across a membrane area per unit time, you know, which also has units, as I already mentioned, that are less intuitive, which is basically a velocity. Okay, but I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna tend to stick to this version because I think it's more intuitive to think about it in those terms. And I know, um, so hold on, I need to add another page. So I know that this permeability has got a value, uh, let me look at my notes here, yeah, of 10 to the minus 10 um, centimeters per second per Pascal. So that's what this permeability P is. How, how is that measured? It's measured using things like I told you about earlier. You're going to notice, if you're paying attention, that the units here are different than the ones that I have down below. Okay, And that is an unfortunate side effect of the fact that there are various ways of writing this. You could write the water flux as a permeability times a pr uh, osmotic pressure. But there's another way of doing it where one writes a different permeability times a delta C, where the delta C is the concentration gradient or concentration difference between inside and outside of salt. And that means that P itself has different units. Okay, I, I'm just acknowledging that. So in the language I'm working right here, note that the water, the water flux on the left up here, this, is related to the osmotic pressure difference. And the thing I'm going to tell you is that delta pi is of order a uh, few times 10 pascals. This is something that you could calculate, and if I, if I remember properly, we will do a homework about it. Um, it's something you could calculate based on your knowledge of the saltiness of, of the ocean, and then also remembering from last time that we worked out that osmotic pressure so you know, this, is, this is the law of osmotic pressure, as long as the concentration is not too large. This thing breaks down at large C. So it's, it's only an approximate treatment, sort of ideal gas law version of osmotic pressure. So what we can see from this is we can work out the water flux. So JW is equal to P times delta pi. I have 10 to the minus 10 centimeters cubed per centimeters uh, oh, sorry no, no, no. centimeters squared per second per Pascal times few times 10 Pascals which gives me a flux of a uh, few times 10 to the minus 9 just a little confused by what I got, but um, centimeters cubed per centimeter squared per second. Sorry, I keep looking down here, but I just, oh, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I, I realize now I, I did indeed make a mistake. I meant to say few times 10 to the six Pascals, that's much, better. That's what was bothering me. Sorry, it's few times 10 bars. I don't like those units. So we end up with few times 10 to the minus 4 centimeters cubed per centimeter squared per second. So again, let me recap my mistake or my confusion, and, and then hopefully your notes will be fine. So there's there was nothing wrong with this equation. And I looked up the P in my notes, which was this, 10 to the minus 10th centimeters cubed per centimeter squared per second per Pascal. And then I remembered few times 10 but my units were wrong for the, the osmotic pressure. That's few times 10 bars. I have to convert that into Pascals. There's a factor of 10 to the fifth difference there. Um, and so I have few times 10 to the six Pascals, which gives me a flux of few times 10 to the minus four.
Okay, so JW times A, the area, is something like few times 10 to the minus four centimeters cubed per centimeter squared per second, and I'm gonna multiply by 100 centimeters squared. That's just my simple estimate for the area, the surface area of the frog, just for ease. And that gives me a uh, few times 10 to the minus two centimeters cubed per second. That's interesting. So now we can compute the time to dry out. And that's approximately equal to, as we already said, the volume divided by JWA. I'm gonna take the volume to be 100 centimeters cubed. And then I divide that by F times 10 to the minus two uh, centimeters cubed per second. And that leaves me with uh, 10 to the fourth divided by few and seconds. Or another way of saying it is few times 10 to the third seconds. So again, this is a crude estimate. And the reason I say it's crude is that um, as we, as the, if you were to take the original differential equation and integrate it, um, we would have found a sort of a more subtle treatment of the, the this time scale would still be re relevant, but it might be appearing in an exponential, and so there's a, a factor of three or something that could be showing up, or a factor of e. Um, and so my point here was not to try to absolutely nail the time scale for the water relaxation to occur, you know, exactly, but more to give you a feel for it. And so in terms of the feel, the logic was, you know, that we we knew that there was more measurements of the permeability, the per and, and then all of it really came down to this simple treatment right here. So the idea that the rate of change of volume is given by the water flux times the area of the frog. And so as I say, you know, that gives me straight away this time scale, which is what we just exploited. Along the way, I, I tried to give you a little bit of a sense of units as shown here. I told you about the experimentally measured permeability given here, and then we quoted the osmotic pressure of putting an object in salt water, which is a few times 10 to the 6 pascals. Anyway, so what comes out of this is uh, a time scale of, you know, hours, and that kind of jibes with what I told you about the 24-hour time scale for survival of frogs put in salt water. Let me note you know, that what I'm missing here that's very biological is I'm pretending that the frog is a passive object. But we know that that's not true. In other words, uh, whether we're talking about bacteria or humans or frogs or salmon going from the ocean into fresh water, there are feedback mechanisms. There are feedback mechanisms that actually are aware that there's been some change in the osmotic state and then there's a response to that. And so this model, this naive story, wasn't meant to give you the whole biology, but was meant to give you a sense of how we would think this through physically. And the next piece in the puzzle would be now what happens at the level of the biology? What, what does a frog do? If we were to do a transcriptome, what would we find about what genes went up and what genes went down and what would be the physiological consequences of that? So that we haven't done. So just to summarize what this whole exercise has done, um, let me stop my mirroring and um, go back over here. So let's summarize this whole story. So uh, I just again point out to you this paper, this really excellent paper, Freshwater Paths Across the Ocean, Molecular Phylog Phylogeny of the Frog, gives insights into amphibian colonization of oceanic islands. Really delightful, just such an interesting paper. I really recommend you read it. So, you know, we learned about well, we learned about DNA science approach. We learned a little bit about ecology and where amphibians are found. We learned about island biogeography, what an oceanic island is. It made us come to terms with ocean currents, the degree of saltiness of the ocean. And then that led us down a physics path. And the physics path was really driven by a toy model of a frog. And we really, you know, we leaned into a spherical frog. And we asked questions about 
entropy mag maximization, osmotic pressure, and what kind of flows we would expect as a result of this process of putting a frog in salt water. So this is the end of this second of our studies of the physics of animal dispersal, migration, and herding. The first one was the bar-tailed godwit. And now what we're going to turn to is the subject of the herds of wildebeest in the Serengeti, which is going to lead us into one of the principal parts of the course, which is field theories of active matter. So with that, uh, I stop this, uh, this discussion. <laughs>